help of divine providence, and thanks to my present financial well-being, I have been able to rescue my beloved birthplace from the hands of creditors. And once again, I am here in my boyhood home. Being here brings back so many memories. I remember with fondness my mother and father and my nine brothers and sisters who live with me and farm the land. My sincere belief in the great author of nature rests on the foundation that was set for me in those early days. I think back on those youthful times with great blessings. I have spent my life in public service. I served in the Continental Congress, signed the Declaration of Independence, and am now Governor of Connecticut. I have the satisfaction of knowing that our glorious cause has been successful and that our new republic seems to finally be on a proper footing with our new constitution. So it is with a mixture of humble pride and happiness that I sit in my birthplace where my long journey began and reflect back on this homestead, which I now, with great regard, refer to as Huntingdon. Samuel Huntington, the future governor of uh, Connecticut, was born on July 16, 1731, in the town of Wyndham, more specifically in the parish called Scotland. It's nice to reflect back upon those early times with my mother and the inspiration she gave me, which I believe helped me develop into the man I became. Recalling studying the scripture with her brings back warm memories. I also remember those long hours toiling on the farm. My brothers and sisters and I worked doing the various tasks required for day-to-day -day operation. Although my father called me his dutiful son, I did not want to take over the farm. I much preferred Book and Quill, where I learned that my strong mind might suit me well in future endeavors, rather than the strong back such work on the farm would require. Samuel may have felt a little restive that he didn't also have the opportunity to go to Yale, and there's indication that he was interested in education, interested in reading, and so forth. He was primarily uh, self-educated, which means he sat and read books and absorbed them the best he could. Uh, the minister, Reverend Devotion, probably opened his library, and uh, probably at least uh, uh, one or two lawyers who lived in Wyndham Center opened their libraries as well. As an older lad, I began to think about my own future. The farm life was not enough for me. Instead, I found myself drawn to the home of our beloved minister and neighbor, Ebenezer Devotion. Reverend Devotion invited me to read and learn from his own books, the classics. I spent many inspiring hours reading in his home, where I was occasionally served tea by his lovely young daughter, Martha, who would one day become my wife. As I read through Reverend Devotion's library, I resolved to learn all I could on my own from books and learn the men I would meet in life. Since my father could not afford to send me to Yale as he had my older brother, my education was entirely in my own hands. Attorney Elizabeth Dyer offered me the opportunity to read his law books, and I accepted. Reading the law prepared me to become an attorney in the town of Wyndham, but I soon decided to improve my practice and moved to Norwich, a bustling city 15 miles to the south. 
There weren't, wasn't a lot of work for lawyers in, in rural communities. So he moved a few miles away to the thriving port town of Norwich. Norwich was growing rapidly. Commerce with the West Indies was bringing a lot of business. There was a lot of work for a lawyer in Norwich, uh, a, an ability to uh, engage in commercial law, an ability to get clients, an ability to get ahead. Huntington was ambitious. He wanted to move up in the world. I worked persistently and soon many satisfied clients and town leaders chose me to become a representative to the Colonial General Assembly. Thus began my lifelong political career. Huntington got involved in politics uh, because he was a lawyer. It's what lawyers did. They do it now, uh, and they did in the, in the 18th century uh, as well. Only four years after arriving in Norwich, Huntington uh, was elected to the lower house of the Colonial Assembly. He had been well respected as a lawyer for his punctuality, for his attention to detail, uh, for his earnestness. I think he was a very civilized man in every way, shape, and form. And uh, this is what made him uh, uh, into a, a popular figure in, in Connecticut, as well as a, uh, a very effective uh, attorney and uh, local leader. Shortly after that, he uh, achieved an even more important goal. He was uh, chosen to be King's attorney for the colony of Connecticut. This was a, a very important job. King's attorney was the equivalent of what today is a district attorney. It was his job to enforce the laws. Samuel Huntington was everywhere in colonial Connecticut. He was everywhere because he was one of those prominent citizens who spent a great deal of time in public service and who naturally was felt to be the type of person that should be doing these things. As we approached the war around 1774, 1775, there was a tremendous amount of anti-British sentiment. Once Boston threw the tea in the harbor and the British then descended, sent in four regiments, closed the port and so forth, Norwich exploded with rage and, and loyalty to America and to, and to Boston in particular. He was very calm and even-tempered, which is what a lawyer is supposed to be, of course. I think that's one of the reasons why he was sent to the Continental Congress, which was a big tribute, representing the whole uh, colony or, or, or soon-to-be state of Connecticut. I arrived in Philadelphia with my fellow Connecticut delegate, Oliver Wolcott, on January 15th, 1776 and met up with the other Connecticut delegate, Roger Sherman. That July, Connecticut joined the other colonies in approving the Declaration of Independence. On August 2, 1776, I, along with many other representatives of our union, signed a document which easily could have been our death warrant. Each one of us knew that in this final break from the king, we risked our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor for what we believed was a glorious cause. Huntington is best understood, uh, I think, as a, a typical person in the era of the American Revolution. Like many of the revolutionary leaders, he was personally ambitious. He wanted to rise in the world. He was also a political moderate, as were most of the people who ended up participating in the American Revolution. He wasn't a radical revolutionary like Sam Adams or John Adams or Patrick Henry, and that's his significance. It's when moderates like Huntington joined the revolutionary cause that it was able to achieve the support it needed uh, to succeed. He impressed everybody there so much with his ability to listen to all sides and so forth, that in 1779 they made him the president of the Continental Congress, which, which was a tribute almost entirely to his personality, I think, because the president of the Continental Congress had no power. Uh, we, tend to, we, we tend to be impressed by the name president, you know, uh, and it, it, it was impressive in the sense that all these people were accepting him as their nominal leader, even though they were so paranoid about giving anybody any power. And I don't mean just the people in Connecticut, but the, everybody in, in the Continental Congress, they didn't, they didn't want a strong president. In October, General Washington defeated the British at Yorktown, which became the final decisive victory of the American Revolutionary War. In my last official letter to General Washington, I stated to him, whatever my future situation in life may be, I shall always love my country. In her happiness and prosperity will consist my own personally. With the declaration signed, 
Huntington took his part in the Revolutionary War serving as president of the Continental Congress. In 1781, three years before the war's end, Huntington left the presidency due to his ill health. Uh, he wanted to come back to uh, Connecticut. He had spent months and months and months away from home. And I think at that stage of his life, he felt that he had done his duty as a citizen. It has been a long and difficult road, and the war for our independence has taken its toll. I am relieved that my first magistrate duties in the Continental Congress have concluded for now. Traveling these old post roads is a relief, and I look forward to returning home after having been away for so long. Samuel Huntington was one of the most prominent founding fathers, serving as both governor and a president during his political career. His legacy lies primarily in the state of Connecticut, where he spent the final years of his life as the state's governor. Uh, one of the things that happened during Samuel Huntington's tenure as governor was the state started to wrestle with this problem. How do we establish passable roads and how do we keep them passable? Creating passable roads was only one of the challenges Huntington had to face as the state's governor. Upon arrival in Norwich, I was honored for my service as president through a 13 cannon salute one cannon shot to represent each state in our glorious union. No other president of Congress has received such an honor on his return home. Now that I have completed my time in Congress, I can focus attention towards improving my beloved Connecticut, partially through the reconstruction of the State House. That 1720 courthouse caught fire during the celebrations at the end of the Revolutionary War, so clearly something was needed. And at the same time, the courts wanted a place to hold session as well. Since the year of 1786, I have enjoyed being the governor of my beloved state of Connecticut. I have, for some time now, strongly advocated for the construction of this new state house. It is with much happiness and approbation that I relish being here in this new magnificent building. I truly believe it will provide a suitable site for state deliberations for many years to come. What he was is able to bring people uh, together and to kind of calm the waters. And in this period, I think that was so significant that this is what needed to be done because it was volatile. And I'm sure that he had to look back on a very, very long career. I have spent my whole life in service to my country. I will leave this life with little regret. It is my lasting hope that if we will exercise mutual candor for each other and sincerely endeavor to maintain our liberties, we may long continue to be a free and happy people. The story of Samuel Huntington lives on through the Samuel Huntington Trust, dedicated to preserving his family's homestead in Scotland, Connecticut. Through education and public outreach, the Trust continues to keep the importance of Huntington's legacy to Connecticut alive.